I'm just going to say, Buzz is a great guy, he's one of my good friends. Whenever we're in the same city, we try to get together. He's a fantastic man, you're going to enjoy his talk, ladies and gentlemen. Colonel and Doctor, Buzz Aldrin. Consider this. We do have slides, maybe? Yeah. All right. I can see it here. Now they told me. But mankind has always been for centuries of reaching space. Other planets, even the stars. But it wasn't until the 20th century that man took to the air. In 1903, the Wright brothers took their first flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. My mother was born that same year. And I guess you could say that pioneering was my destiny. You see, her maiden name was Marion Moon. <laughs> and I took my first flight at age two with my father, Edwin Eugene Aldrin. And it was in a Lockheed single engine, Lockheed Vega, and it was painted to look like an eagle. The symbol of our country and the name of our spacecraft landed on the moon. Now, surrounded by this influence of aviation, I entered the Air Force after graduating from the Military Academy at West Point. I was in the Korean War as a jet fighter pilot. I flew 66 combat missions. 
Following the Korean War, I was uh, stationed in Germany in the late 50s. The Cold War was accelerating. The tensions were high. In October 1957, the Soviet Union pulled off a very sudden and unexpected technological feat. They launched beep, 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 Sputnik into orbit. And a year later, America formed the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. With the goal of reaching space. So the space age was formed, and the space race was about to begin. In 1961, NASA launched America's first Mercury astronaut, Alan Shepard, on a 15-minute suborbital flight that touched the edge of space. Now, the Russians had already achieved an incredible accomplishment by sending the first human into space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, one full orbit around the Earth. President Kennedy asked NASA what is possible. They told him that it would take 15 years before we could put a man on the moon. I recently learned, however, at the 100th anniversary of the MIT Aero Astro Department, that Kennedy visited NASA and asked the engineers to figure out how to get to Mars. So they worked over a weekend and came back with the answer. It was just a little bit too hard. The moon might be a more realistic goal. Now that probably was the busiest weekend that NASA ever has spent. <laughs> Can you imagine one weekend to do that? So on May 25th, 1961, three weeks after Alan Shepard's flight, President Kennedy boldly challenged America to commit to the goal of landing a man on the moon before the end of the decade. We hadn't even put anyone in orbit. The rockets and spacecraft just really didn't exist. And many thought this challenge was going to be impossible. We just didn't seem to have the know-how. But we did have a leader with the vision the determination, the courage, and the confidence that we could get there. By publicly stating our goal, putting a specific time period on this specific achievement, President Kennedy gave us no way out. Yeah, we didn't have the best plan, but we did uh, develop it a little later. Now, if space was going to be our next frontier, then I wanted to be a part of getting there. So I decided to continue my education and receive my doctorate in astronautics from MIT. Now, back with the master's degree, just go right for a doctorate. For my thesis, I devised a technique for two man, two spacecraft to join up in orbit called manned orbital rendezvous. Sort of patterned after intercepting another airplane in the atmosphere. Little did anyone know, including me, how critical this work would be to our later successfully landing on the moon and coming back. 
He had to find a girl to get back. Now, the first time I applied to be an astronaut, I was turned down because I hadn't gone to test pilot training in, in my plans. Um, somehow I just didn't think that that was really necessary. So that was it. But I was determined and I applied again. Now this time, my fighter experience in combat and NASA's interest in the concept I had for space rendezvous influenced them to accept me in the third group of astronauts. And I became known among my peers, Navy, Marines, and Air Force, as Dr. Rendezvous. <laughs> now, it wasn't always a complimentary uh, <laughs> description. But you know these guys, they're trying to poke fun at you. Mercury was the first stage of our space program, followed by the Gemini program. And it is correct to call it Gemini or Gemini. They're both in the dictionary. The one I read, anyway. <laughs> now, this two-man spacecraft was used to fill the gap as the rockets were being developed for Apollo. It took a while. So, Gemini became an integral part of our training. And it helped us learn to do things like spacewalking, long-duration flight, computer entry, and, of course, Rendezvous. Now, I was an avid scuba diver. I was the first astronaut to train underwater for the simulated weightlessness of space. This is a swimming pool. You can see the bubbles going up. During my first flight as a pilot, really a co-pilot, there's a commander, Jim Lovell, but uh, we don't want to degrade the term by calling somebody a co-pilot. The commander and a pilot. I was the pilot of Gemini 12, and I was able to set a record of five and a half hours uh, spacewalking outside the spacecraft, circling the globe every 90 minutes at the speed of 17,500 miles an hour. What a sight to behold outside the spacecraft. By the way, did you know that this was the first selfie? <laughs> Six out of seven missions is pretty close to that. 
but also we really believed that we had a, about a 95% chance of returning home safely. And uh, combat sometimes is more, sometimes is a little less. We accept those odds. But they certainly were more than acceptable to us at the time. And those odds were with us, and we successfully landed on the moon. It was And it, it truly was one small step for man and a giant leap for mankind. Now, Neil was already on the surface, and he was taking a few photographs of me as I backed down the ladder after partially closing the hatch. I didn't hear too many people laugh when they heard this being careful not to lock it on my way out. <laughs> now, as I stepped on the talcum like lunar dusk, dusk, the first words that came to my mind were magnificent desolation. It was magnificent accomplishment for humans to set foot on another world for the first time. And yet, there was the total desolation of what we looked out on. No atmosphere, no air, nothing growing anywhere, just gray. I don't know how many shades of gray, whether it was 50 shades. <laughs> But you can see the horizon kind of going away. It was so clear. And uh, there probably wouldn't have been a very successful flat moon society. <laughs> but it was black, black sky. You couldn't see the stars because there was too much brightness for our eyes. Now, this photograph that you're looking at now is uh, the one that Neil took of me. It's called the visor photo, because you can see a reflection of the Eagle spacecraft and Neil in the visor of my helmet. Now people have asked me why this iconic photo is so great. I have three words, location, location, location. <laughs> Neil being the commander, had the camera most of the time. It was my job to sort of set up the experiments, but I did get a chance to take a few photos. And this is my blueprint on the moon. It was so uh, distinct what, what the dust did when we put our foot down. I just felt I had to take a picture. I took a before and after. But it still looked a little lonely, so I did take another picture of a print and then the boot slightly to one side. Now my son Andy has turned into a, quite a photographer, uh, underwater on elephants and sharks and alligators. And he says that uh, with all the photographs that he's taken, thousands of pictures, as a photographer, but I've only taken a few pictures in my life, and, and this one turns out to be one of the most iconic photos. <laughs> Man, once you get it right, why keep pressing on? <laughs> Back on Earth, everyone felt like they had participated in this incredible journey. The world welcomed us back as heroes from the moon, but we understood that they were not cheering just for three guys, but for what we represented. That by the world coming together, we had accomplished the impossible. The true 
value of Apollo. It is the amazing story of innovation and teamwork that overcame many obstacles to reach the moon. And I feel very privileged to have played a part in this historical event. So today, at the age of 87, my life. Than ever, and I feel like things are really coming together. I feel I consider myself a global space statesman, and I've been doing the very best that I can to move things forward. Now, people ask me, why do we need to go to Mars? Why do we even need a space program? Because by venturing into space, we improve life for everyone here on Earth. The scientific achievements that come from space-based research create products and technology that we use in our daily lives. For example, in cell phones, TV, GPS, medical advances, many of these would not have been possible without the investments in the space program. Professor Stephen Hawking recently said, and I quote, we have made remarkable progress in the last 100 years, but if we want to continue, our future is in space. I couldn't agree more. I won't be around to see much of it, but I want to do everything that I can to lay the groundwork. And this is why I wrote my plan for the future in my book, Mission to Mars, released in 2013. There have been some improvements, refinements since then, but it was published by National Geographic. And now I have a kid's book called Welcome to Mars, published in September 2015. And this kid's book was selected as the best science STEM book by the National Science Teachers Association, two years in a row. And I'm very proud of this book. because it's important because these are the ones who will be carrying out the Mars missions. We're not going to get there next week. I think we have things to get done to recover from the not really great situation we're in right now. We can't even put somebody in space up to our $100 billion space station. Now, I pride myself in thinking outside the box, leading by innovation. And in the past year, I've been involved in the creation of virtual reality content so that you can help see what it's like to stand on the surface of Mars, including a project called Destination Mars, produced by NASA, JPL, and Microsoft. And just a few weeks ago, at the South by Southwest conference, we unveiled my cycling pathways to Mars, visual reality, virtual reality experience, developed by 8i on the Time Life VR application. It's a visualization of my long-term plan of a moon base and a permanent colony at Mars using cycler spacecraft and trajectories. And guess what, you lucky folks can view my VR app right here at Comic-Con. So don't miss it. It's your chance to take a journey to the moon and to Mars with me. Don't forget.
forget to get your H.I. video with Holo Buzz. That's the name of something. It's my mini me in augmented reality. I've been planning this space transportation system of cycling pathways. Earth orbit, Earth to moon, moon orbit, and Earth to Mars. Since 1985, and now with the help of Purdue University and my Buzz Aldrin Institute at Florida Tech, I have a team that's helping me develop these concepts that I've been working on for 30 years. And I'm certainly an advocate for international cooperation in space. We can't do it all alone. Nobody can. We have to bring people together and we can't be spending everything that other people can be doing while we plan and assemble things and make them work. And even though we landed on the moon 15 years ago, I believe we cannot ignore the moon now. And I feel the U.S. should help these other nations reach the moon and build a base to continue research and to discover the ice. The ice around the moon will create lunar fuel to refuel the landers that go up and down right from the beginning. And even though we've learned how to do that in the backyard with segmented time spans of this routine operation. When you explore on Mars, you're looking for something new. It's not routine. So you can't segment things, but you can something like refueling on the moon and convince yourself that if things are similar, we can refuel a lander on Mars from the Earth. Working together will make this vision a success. And it all has the goal of a permanent settlement on Mars. That means you land and you stay there. And people aren't going to buy that right away. It's going to take some steps of convincing the practicality, the objectives that we're setting out for us and together how we can achieve that. I can guarantee you, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, I figured I would use all the help I could get. So, in March, uh, last year, I visited Stonehenge and I sent a message out to the cosmos. <laughs> Spirit. I've been up to the North Pole on a Russian nuclear icebreaker and down almost 4,000 meters, about two miles, to the ocean floor to see the Titanic and a yellow French submarine. <laughs> My favorite thing to do on this planet, however, is scuba diving. And here I am on the trip in the Galapagos Islands in 2010. My son Andy took this photo of me hitching a ride on a whale shark. Now it's not something you kids out there have to just jump in and, and, uh, and do that at home or wherever you find it. So I finally made it to the South Pole last month to cap off my exploration experiences. It was a little tougher than I had expected. I knew it was not sea level, it was 9,000 feet, 6,000 feet of ice. But it was all worth it. And I got the record for the oldest person to reach the South Pole. We do these things not because they're easy, 
but because they're hard. And I plan to keep pushing boundaries as long as possible. So, you never know where I'm going to be in the world. Now, if you're interested in learning more about my vision from Mars, you can go to my website, www.buzzaldrin.com. Humanity needs to explore or expire. We need to go beyond current limits, just like we did in 1969. Apollo was the story of people at their very best. We started with a dream, and we did the impossible. I know we did it without living proof. Back with these naysayers. We've taken pictures now of the blueprints from orbit. But we know. Convince me too. we can do it again with a lot of help. So let's go do it again and let's go for it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, guys. Okay. Hey, thank you. Any coming out? 
Uh, have you looked, used a telescope to look back towards Tranquility Base and make sure your footprints are still there? Since you left. No, I've looked at the photos from uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and uh, we taped our uh, explanations of what we did and how, while I was going back up in the ladder, uh, Neil went back to the crater behind us, the west crater, the one that uh, had these big boulders in it. They weren't quite so big. But anyway, he wanted to take pictures of it. So I was going back up into the spacecraft, and he went back, and then turned around and came back a slightly different way. And by gosh, you can see that in the photographs. It is not footprints, but it, each time you put your foot down, it sprays out dust, and it changes the color, the albedo. And after 40 years, it's still there. And it agrees with what we said. So all you naysayers forget it. <laughs> we were there. Uh, hi, uh, I was wondering actually, what's the realistic timeline, uh, time frame to go to Mars to colonize it, if we put all our efforts into that? Well, if we put all our something into it, we're going to go broke. Uh, it has to be done with a term that I have been cultivating, I think it's called fiscal discipline. <laughs> Over the years, we have begun to do some things and develop things that some of us feel the continued development may not be the best thing. We may be able to phase out a little earlier things like the ISS, Otherwise, vested interest and congressional support are going to keep it going forever. The Orion spacecraft, with all respect to Lockheed, something was needed when we retired the orbiter. And it doesn't look like that spacecraft is going to fly with a crew in it until 10 years after, when we hoped it would be ready. And uh, the launch system called, well, it was shut launch system. And it evolved into the constellation Aries 1, Aries 5. This may be a little detail they don't know. Why don't you tell them when, in your plan when you think that we'll get to Mars? How about that? When things aren't working, it's a good idea to know maybe why they aren't working why someone needs to get re-elected in a particular place. And, uh, I may get into trouble. <laughs> but, but if there's a swamp in Washington, D.C., there is also one in the state of Alabama. Let's not go there. But, but, but why don't you remember? Now, I have a nice plan. We just gradually find something else for them to do. <laughs> and generally, it's much better than what they've been doing, really. They're not convinced of it yet. Well, you've written a speech for the president for the 50th anniversary of uh, your moon landing, which is going to be in 2019. I believe, what's the speech you have? You're always writing. Oh, oh, oh this is for July 20th, 2019. Uh, I believe that this nation should commit itself within two decades for America to lead international crews to occupy Mars. Now, two decades, that seems like a long time. That's around 2040. NASA says maybe 2030s or something. Uh, we got a lot to do between 
now and then, and it will be gradual progress. And I believe that uh, the young kids born in the year 2000 will be the people who will make the up first cruise to land on Mars. And we will train them at the moon, in orbit, doing the things for a short while that they will be doing in orbit, assembling things, refueling at Mars. And then we'll send them down to the surface for a short while. So they really get to see what it's like living in a base that was designed to be the kind of base we would want to put on Mars. And if we've thought about it properly, it will be pretty close to that. And maybe the same nations will build certain parts of it for the moon and certain parts of it uh, for Mars. He can talk about this all day. So it all makes more sense to me. To ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We we have one of our brethren right here. He's got one of our Get Your Ass to Mars shirts on. Woo! I mean, I like your suspenders. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have to take a picture of you. Well, that's the question first, so I, I gotta think about it here. Okay. Um, thank you for buying our shirt, by the way. Yeah. All of our Mars shirts, just FYI, including the one he has on, is a fundraiser for Buzz's Education Foundation. Uh, okay, uh, before I ask the question, I just want to say uh, I'm an astronomical engineering graduate student. And you've been a huge inspiration to me and uh, my fellow colleagues. But um, if we go to Phobos before we go to Mars, would you rather have a like an orbiting mothership where you can land her up and down from Phobos, or would you rather build a base on Phobos so we can use that as a, a stepping stone? I've uh, given that a lot of thought. And I know people have predicted us just reading it again. He sent a letter to President Trump. And he thinks we should go to Demos for the nuclear reactor there. And I'm not sure that he really leads to ever putting people on the surface. Now, there are a lot of things that uh, that have going for you when you get a little bit lower, like where focus is, it's 2.4 Mars radii away. And uh, instead of landing on the surface, which I thought we would do and put structures down there that we could live in and uh, track things happening on the surface, There's something in orbital mechanics that you can look up, and it caught the fancy of NASA when, when they didn't think President Obama's idea of sending a crew to an asteroid in 2025 and, and coming back. I thought for a while, where did you get that idea? And I submitted it the year before for a study. But I knew that just sending a crew there, opening the hatch, going EVA, and it, well, that's not very much. <clears throat> now, if you send just a robot, when it's 30 seconds away, and you got time lag and it's doing different things, and, uh, it's not too productive either. But I can't understand why this great swamp in Washington, D.C., that has space-like people, human, and has scientists. I know they compete for funds, but at least they ought to talk to each other. And if we send a robot, slow, saving fuel, year and a half, and it gets there two days after a crew that can stay there 60 days and come back, and on the crew we can have a scientist who knows everything about asteroids, and particularly this one he's looking at out the window. And we got another guy who designed, built the robot 
until it launched. And now he's looking out the window too. We got these two experts. That's a hell of a lot better than either one. Why don't we put them together? Okay. But what you want to learn about and photos? Congress to understand that, they don't quite get the idea. If you want to know what he wants to do at Phobos, though, go to our virtual reality. The thing he was talking about, it's across the street. You can, everybody can go to the ADI booth and do the uh, cycling pathways to Mars, and it'll show you what's going on at Phobos and his plan. Let's get this young lady right here. Yeah, well, let's go a little faster. Right? No, you're using a lot of your time. you got 10 minutes. All right, let's go. After that inspirational speech, I feel really awkward asking this question, but, um, how did you and Neil Armstrong decide who would walk on the moon first? Like, was there a rock, paper, scissors competition going on? Uh, <laughs> there's a pecking order. There's something called seniority. I was the oldest, but that's not what I mean. Neil was in the second group. I was in the third group with Mike. But Neil was a fantastic test pilot. Now, all the missions before, when they opened the hatch, when the guy went out, he was never the commander, because he was, he had many things to train to do. And go to the moon, he's, got, he's the one that's landing, and he's the one that's lifting off. So there was a group of people who were involved in, um, Experiment works. Who said, well, we put too much of a workload on the commander. This ought to be done by the, by the junior person, the co-pilot. Well, you can do both if you think about it, but we never, I mean, the symbolism and the media, who's going to get out first, what's he going to say? And uh, it really screws things up when you're trying to reach correct decisions. Absolutely no doubt that the senior person symbolically should do the thing that is symbolic. And he did that. And then we got outside. But he's a leader and I'm a follower. It was not specified who was doing this and that. So we could have worked it out a little bit better. But that's why we do things and uh, we debrief afterward and come up with, with better solutions. The way it was done was correct, absolutely. I looked at the, the camera that I turned on out the window, and I saw Neil getting his contingency sample. And then I thought, now what would it have been like if the commander had been looking out his window and I was out there doing that stuff? That would just not have worked at all. It was not right. What we did was absolutely correct, but we need uh, discussions and debates. And sometimes the pressure of what's he going to say? What's he going to say when he gets out there? It becomes a bit too much. It takes things out of perspective. Sorry. That's all I have to say. That. I think that was a good story. Thank you. I'm Randy, join the team. Um, so you've been an inspiration to me directly, but even before that, it was indirectly. So I have to ask, how did you get your name? Um, what does it mean? And how do you feel knowing that Pixar name was like year after year? <laughs> did we allow just one question? Okay. You want me to say it so it goes quickly? My, I have two older sisters. And uh, I come along, and my father's Edwin Eugene Alder, I'm Edwin Eugene Alder and Junior. They didn't want a junior. And uh, the Air Corps people called my father Eddie. My mother hated that. So she called him Gene, and everybody in the family called my father Gene. So they hadn't uh, given it all that much thought. And uh, so my older sister was occasionally uh, teasing uh, 
her baby brother. She couldn't pronounce brother. It, it was butter. <laughs> That's absurd, isn't it? <laughs> Believe it or not, I ran into another guy who had the same name of Buzz, and he got it the same way. <laughs> This Toy Story business, uh, I had to teach that dummy everything he had to learn. <laughs> okay, then he came back and, and uh, we gave him a parade. Yeah, he did do it. He did do a ticker tape parade with him at Disney World. I hate to go into the details, but uh, no, no, don't go into details. <laughs> So let's take another question. Ha, um, do you think that the search for extraterrestrial life would be fruitful, or do you think that colonizing our solar system is the only way to guarantee that life stays existing in our galaxy? Well, to the answer to your first question, the answer can be yes, we'll find it, or no, we won't. And I think both answers uh, are ones we're looking for, one or the other. And will, will we uh, find that close by? <laughs> the universe is enormous. And speed of light just doesn't get you very far if you can travel that fast. Now, I get friends that think we'll be <laughs> traveling by high frequency gravity waves. I don't understand that. I'm not sure that he does, but it may be that the influence of gravity is faster than the speed of light. I don't know that. And I ain't signing around anymore. Uh, no, but you did sign But, but right the, whatever speed we go, uh, there's so much out there, uh, we may find some evidence but not in a physical way. They're so far away that we, we may communicate in some way. Um, what language? I don't know. We got, we got two more minutes, so let's try to do two more, quick. You've been my inspiration as, as an astronomer and an astrophysicist ever since I was a little boy looking up on the moon thinking, Mr. Buzz went there. I want to as well. My question to you, good sir, is there anything on this Earth that you've experienced that compares to what you felt getting off that lunar module? Uh, stepping off? Uh, I, I mean, it was intellectually a, a, a significant achievement. It had been done before. <laughs>
that somehow turn over the keys to the future to one fortunate person who has been able to uh, do fantastic things in their life. But I, I just don't think that those people really want it that way. I think that they want to work together. And uh, that's is something that is going to have to be worked out, just like a lot of things. They're a great inspiration. They fit into plans very nicely. And, uh, uh, and, and big companies that have been around for a long time, they fit in too. Sometimes they want it all. And uh, they got somebody in Congress that'll help that happen. And uh, that's called a lobbyist. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're out of time. The parts of the swamp. <laughs>